Okay, so thank you for joining us this evening. Um, folks who followed the West Seattle Transportation Coalition for a while may recall that one of the first things we ever did um, was all the way back in 2017, um, prior to the passage of uh, Sound Transit 3, I believe, or maybe right after, I'm getting my dates all messed up, but we did one of the first community gatherings just to sort of get people thinking and excited about what it might look like coming here and what some of your uh, questions and concerns were that, and we gathered that and shared with Sound Transit at the time. And so here we are in 2022 and it's becoming more and more of a reality as we go forward. Um, I shared, uh, as folks were coming in earlier, I shared a slide here um, that's a Sound Transit branded slide. Just uh, reminding everyone that the draft EIS comment period does run from January 28th to April 28th. Um, and they have an online open house at wsblink.participate.online. Um, although uh, one of their reps will be up here in just a few minutes to do a very quick uh, overview of the proposal as it currently stands. Um, tonight's agenda, we're gonna keep it moving pretty quickly and keep to the times that we usually do for our, our monthly membership meetings. Um, we're at the top with welcome and introductions. My name is Michael Taylor Judd. I'm chair of the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. I use he, him pronouns, and I live in the North Delridge neighborhood. Um, we'll proceed to that overview of the light rail proposal, like I said, um, and then we'll roll into a quick uh, overview of what's an EIS process. Um, how you might make comments on the draft EIS, talk about some examples of how to make good public comments, um, and then we'll have a chance for Q&A. Uh, at that point, we'll uh, go to some tables here in the room where folks can sort of jot some things down on flip charts if they wanna capture notes or talk with each other. And I will try in this hybrid environment um, to open breakout rooms so that if folks wanna go into, um, you know, and I'll open a few of them, if folks wanna go and gather in a, an online room and chat with each other um, about what you think you want to comment on or um, get uh, opinions from your neighbors elsewhere in West Seattle, um, we will give that opportunity. Um, and then uh, we will uh, close the meeting and wrap up at 8.30. Uh, we do have a chat available. I see there's something in the chat right now. Um, so folks are, are welcome to chat there. Um, I think, uh, are you keeping an eye on the chat, Jeremy, at all or? Okay, um, so just in case something comes in that we should be concerned about or need to answer. Um, Kim, we're glad that you found your way in. <laughs> Um, I'm going to keep us moving forward. Um, so a quick introduction here. So for those who are not, uh, who've never been with us before, um, the West Seattle Transportation Coalition is a peninsula-wide organization working to address transportation and commuting challenges for the nearly 100,000 people living and working here on the West Seattle Peninsula. We accomplish this by doing things like securing the support of the residents of the peninsula, engaging elected officials at all levels to make improvements for all transportation users. Um, those who've uh, joined us in the past, we've had anyone from, uh, I think we've got Mayor Harrell coming later in May, yes? Yes, I, I'm getting confirmation of that. So we'll have Mayor Harrell at our May meeting, um, but we've had all the way up to uh, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, um, who we're trying to get with us again uh, this year. Um, we've had the head of West uh, Washington State Ferries and even a uh, former watchdog head. Um, we, uh, we partner with government agencies like we're doing tonight. Uh, Sound Transit is in the room here and uh, we'll be speaking shortly um, to try and help educate people and, and get them involved. Um, and then we engage with you, know, you, with businesses, with community organizations, with neighborhood groups to educate and collect feedback. Um, our goals are affordable and equitable transportation options, particularly in historically underserved neighborhoods, a transportation network that moves people and goods in an environmentally sustainable manner, and investments in transportation infrastructure to match Seattle's growth. Uh, we've identified four priorities that we're, uh, we're keeping an eye on as a group for 2022. Um, it should come as no surprise that like many of you, 
We are anxious to see uh, capacity restored in the West Seattle Bridge Transportation Corridor. Um, while we're uh, in the detour scenario, we're advocating for funding maximum mobility um, to help us move around as easily and, and quickly as possible. Um, you'll see obviously tonight, um, we support Sound Transit 3 planning, education and outreach and encouraging all of our neighbors to learn what's going on and, and express their opinions about what they like and don't like about the Link Light Rail. Um, and we're currently monitoring the SR-160 Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal uh, Trestle and Span Replacement Project, which is a really complicated name for essentially uh, Washington State Ferries is looking at uh, how to rebuild and refurbish um, the Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal. Uh, a couple of our board members are on that community advisory group, and so we occasionally have them coming out um, and updating us on what's going on there. Uh, I'm going to pause here in our uh, PowerPoint and switch over to a PDF. And uh, is it Laura that's coming up or who's coming? Oh, it's Lita. Um, I'm going to invite Lita from Sound Transit to come on up to do a quick overview of the light rail proposal. The joys of this application, though. Yeah, technical difficulties. <laughs> I had the PDF open and now it's not here. Yeah, if you want to come and start talking, and then I will get us caught up here. Okay. On the, Wait, bring the mic down yep. a little bit <laughs> for the short gals. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you so much to West Seattle Transportation Coalition for hosting this. Uh, my name is Lita Shaheem. I'm the Government and Community Relations Manager at Sound Transit. I see some familiar faces. Um, we are happy to be here and just give a very brief project overview. We know the focus tonight is to get in there and answer some questions and, and make some comments. Um, so we'll start with a, a brief project overview. I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Jason Hampton, who will, thank you. Right here. All right. Who will, um, who will walk us through a draft, the draft environmental impact statement. And then we will talk about how to make a comment. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, project overview. Yeah, why don't we keep going? Let's go to that um, colorful map there. Next slide, sorry. Oh. Oh yeah, new share, good idea. There you go. Okay, now we got it. All right, so just, um, just to give you a sense uh, of what we're building towards, on the right, you see um, our operating plan in 2042, um, where we expect to um, be able to take the light rail from West Seattle and head up north to Everett, um, all the way on one ride there. You can stop at the University of Washington on your way. Um, you can also transfer at the Soto station uh, to the green line there, the one line, and take that down to the airport or Tacoma um, from West Seattle. We're also expanding over to the east side, um, with uh, East Link opening up in the next couple of years, next year or so. And, um, but then you'll see over on the left, this is when we actually open up um, the West Seattle extension uh, in 2032. That's when we expect to serve um, West Seattle. At that point in time, folks will be getting off at Soto to connect in to the full system. Um, and so on the right, the difference is that you have the Ballard extension built out with a new downtown tunnel. And you can see you go from Ballard um, on the right all the way down to Tacoma uh, and SeaTac. Um, so that's kind of the system and the operating plan. Um, and we are excited about that. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so um, this is just a, uh, the project schedule overall. Um, we are expecting, as I mentioned, to start service to West Seattle in 2032. Um, and we're right now in the planning phase, which goes from 2017 to 2023. I'm gonna just dive into that for a little bit more on the next slide, but then we go from um, planning to design and design goes from 2023 to 2027. And finally, construction, which would start 2026 for this project and go until 2032. Next slide. All right, so zooming into the planning phase, um, we have on the left from 2017 to 2019 is the alternatives development process. So coming out of the ST3 plan that voters approved in 2016, we did a process and um, I think uh, the West Seattle Transportation Coalition even hosted a workshop leading up to that as well um, to look at what alternatives we should study in environmental review. We are now, uh, we have now, we're now over on the right. We have published an environmental document um, and we published that in late January and we're now in the public comment period. Um, based on the analysis in the draft environmental impact statement, which we'll all be talking a lot more about in a moment um, and what that is, and the public comments, so your comments, you're gonna inform our board, um, our 18 member board, um, what the, uh, whether they should confirm or modify the preferred alternatives. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, then we published the final EIS in late 2023. So we still, we have more work to do. Um, we published a draft, then we published a final um, and the board will select a project to be built after that. And we have a federal record of decision and that allows us to go in and start design work. Next slide. So on the last slide, I talked a little bit about these preferred alternatives, preferred alternatives with, um, we have preferred alternatives. We have preferred alternatives with third-party funding. We have other draft EIS alternatives. You'll see preferred alternatives in pink in various places as well as those um, alternatives in brown for the preferred alternatives with third-party funding and the blue for the other draft EIS alternatives. We went into this process based on the alternatives development phase um, of the project. Our board in May of 2019 and uh, in October, they identified preferred alternatives um, and they alternative <laughs> identified preferred alternatives with third-party funding um, and other draft EIS alternatives coming into the environmental process. But now we have done a lot of analysis on all these alternatives and those categories may change. They may, the board may confirm those, um, what the preferred alternative is, or they may modify it. And so that's what the feedback and the analysis is helping to, to inform. But we study all the alternatives, no matter what their title is um, equally. And we look at them both for construction and operations. Okay, next slide. So this is an overview of the process, um, just a snapshot of it, um, of kind of getting us to the point where the board is going to be confirming or modifying the preferred alternative. You see across the top, there are um, months, states. So um, uh, particularly in gray, you see some gray shading there. That is the comment period that goes from late January to late February or late April, sorry. <laughs> April 28th is the end of the comment period. It's 90 days, um, which is actually extended um, from 45 days. Um, and so uh, across the top, that's the, the timeline. So then you see in orange, there's the draft EIS public meetings. We just wrapped those up uh, last month with uh, four virtual hearings and, and two or one um, one in-person meeting. We have community advisory groups that are meeting monthly approximately and digging into the draft EIS materials. Those are uh, live streamed and recorded so you can always catch up uh, on what's happening and sort of deep dive materials related to, there's a group specifically focused on West Seattle and the Duwamish Crossing. And um, we're gathering feedback, we're gathering feedback and we're sharing that with the Sound Transit Board. And so what we expect is that um, our system expansion committee of the board will have a workshop on the draft EIS um, and, um, and then in May, we expect to share summary of the public comments and all of the comments received with the Sound Transit board. So after the comment period is concluded, and then we expect in June that they would uh, take up this potential um, direction around confirming or modifying a preferred alternative, and our board ultimately would confirm or modify the preferred alternatives 
um, in, in late June. Um, so that's the process. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna actually hand it over to Jason to just really quickly um, tell us about the alternatives and the snapshot of the draft EIS results to help folks in their comp. Jason, go ahead. Thanks, everybody can hear me? Yeah. All right, so before we go into the draft EIS alternatives uh, that we're presenting today, I just wanna share what's in an EIS. So uh, what's in an EIS? It's an environmental impact statement. Uh, it provides agencies and the public an understanding of the environmental consequences to it. Can you yeah, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Jason Hampton. I'm with Green Transit. I'm the segment manager for the Duwamish, Del Ridge, and West Seattle Junction segments of the project. Thanks a lot. Sorry about that. So the, the draft EIS uh, looks at the scope, uh, a range, a broad range of alternatives in this case in West Seattle. It uh, looks at the potential impacts and it also looks at the potential mitigation. Next slide, please. <laughs> so there's a lot in an EIS, uh, three different categories. We have the built environment, the natural environment, and the transportation environment. You can see here on this slide, there's a number of topics in each one. I'm not gonna go through every one. Uh, today, we're gonna go over those alternatives in the draft EIS, and then we're gonna give a high level summary of just some of these categories, but just know that the books back there have a lot more information and we're gonna be happy to talk about that uh, when, I'm, when I'm done here. Next slide, please. So we have uh, three segments we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to start with the Duwamish. Uh, this just shows where the Duwamish fits into the context for the uh, overall Ballard and West Seattle Link extensions. Um, next slide, please. So in the Duwamish segment, we have three different alternatives. All would be elevated uh, all the way through the corridor. Um, all would include a new high-level fixed rail-only bridge over the Duwamish waterway. Uh, the height of the bridge over the West waterway would match that of the existing West Seattle Bridge. So we'd have 140-foot clearance over the navigable waterway on the West waterway there. I'm just gonna briefly uh, call these out. Uh, the South Crossing alternative shown in pink, that's the, the preferred alternative. Uh, Lita described that earlier. Uh, it would travel south along the Soto busway, uh, curving to the west and crossing the SR-99 and West Seattle Bridge uh, around 4th Avenue South, continuing to the west and curving around the north edge of Pigeon Point, uh, and then following Delridge Way south into the Delridge segment. Uh, the south edge crossing alternative, uh, which is shown at the bottom with a blue liner, it's very similar on the east side of SR-99, but around SR-99, it curves a little bit further south and crosses Harbor Island on the very south edge of Terminal 102 before curving back to the north and kind of following the same line as the pink preferred around Pigeon Point. The third alternative is the north crossing alternative. Uh, it would follow the Soto Busway south, but it would curve to the west earlier, uh, crossing the east and west waterway and Harbor Island north of the existing West Seattle and Spokane Street Swing Bridges. Uh, before curving south to follow Delridge Way. Next slide, please. So this is just a really high level summary of, of some of the draft EIS results and some of the key differentiators. I'm not gonna go through every one of these. We have all of these back here and we'd be happy to talk kind of on a, on a more personal level. Um, I'll just know that, you know, we look at project cost, displacements and uh, park effects on this. And at the bottom right, uh, it's worth noting that we have a performance key. So the darker blue indicates a higher performance in that category and the lighter blue indicates a lower performance. And we also have some other considerations, things that uh, we're thinking about when we look at these alternatives. Next slide, please. Thanks. So this looks at two different segments and we're gonna look at them together. This is the Delridge segment and the West Seattle Junction segment. Uh, they're very interconnected uh, because of the different heights uh, when connecting to tunnel or elevated stations at Avalon or Alaska Junction. Um, so we like to look at these together. Next slide, please. So you can see here, we have a broad range of alternatives. I'm gonna start with Delridge and I'm just gonna do a high level overview here. All of the Delridge alternatives are elevated. Each would include one station, uh, which would be elevated. And they're essentially in three different locations. I'm gonna start at the North, which is at the top. You can see the Andover Street Station, which would be just west of Delridge Way, north of Andover, near the southeast corner of Nucor. 
Uh, that station would connect to Avalon in, in one of two different ways. Uh, it could continue west along Andover and then curve to the southwest following the Avalon Way right of way. And that connects to an elevated Avalon station. Or it would continue further west along the Andover and the Yancey Corridor uh, over 32nd Avenue and then follow uh, closely the West Seattle Bridge approach to Fauntleroy. That would be into a retain cut station at Avalon. Retain cut station is similar to what we have at the International District. It's below ground, but it's an open top station. So the next station location in Delridge is on Delridge Way. It's a Delridge Way station alternatives. That would be on Delridge, north of Dakota, south of Andover, and that would be over the roadway with station entrances on both sides of Delridge. From there, it would uh, continue to the south, curving to the west along Genesee, either on the south side of Genesee along the north edge of the West Seattle Golf Course or on the north side of Genesee. Um, and that would connect to either an elevated or tunnel station at Avalon. Uh, finally, we have the Dakota Street Station shown with the pink box there. Uh, the Dakota Street Station alternatives would be uh, south of Dakota Street between Delridge Way and 26th Avenue Southwest. Uh, that too would follow Genesee either on the south side or north side. And also that could connect to a tunnel or elevated station at Avalon. So shift into the, uh, the further west segment, the West Seattle Junction segment, it would have two stations, one at Avalon and one at West Seattle Junction. Uh, there's different options for either elevated or tunnel at both of those stations. And in general, the stations at Avalon are in the vicinity of Genesee and 35th Avenue Southwest and Avalon Way. The junction stations are clustered in kind of two different areas. We have stations at 41st or 42nd at Alaska or between 41st and 42nd, just south of Alaska. And then we have another station you can see noted there with the elevated Fauntleroy Way. Uh, that would be just over here actually uh, at Fauntleroy Way and Alaska. And that would be an elevated station. Next slide, please. So again, we have a, a summary here and, and I'm not gonna get into all of the specifics. You can see the similar categories on the left to what we saw for Duwamish. We use that same performance key. Uh, we note some of the other considerations here and we do have these uh, materials back there so we can uh, fold through them and, uh, and talk more about those. The next slide and I think I'm gonna hand it over to Lita, thanks. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk just a little bit of, well, I guess I just wanted, I don't know if, um, did you already speak to this, no, Jason? No, I'll just hit this last slide. So um, what you see here now um, on the previous slide, you know, we just couldn't fit all of the alternatives on one graphic. So you can see here that we've just added the comparison for the Delridge Way, uh, um, uh, Delridge Station location. So that's there um, for your reference. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how to make a comment. Um, and, uh, and this is, of course, I think going to be built upon later on. So um, we did publish the draft EIS January 28th. We have a public comment period, as I mentioned, that goes until April 28th. So this is really good timing. You still have a few weeks and maybe even get your comment in tonight. Uh, next slide. You can provide a comment in many different ways. You can provide it online. Our um, website, wsblink.participate.online, has a form. You can click comment form and fill it in there. You can also find out all the other ways that you can comment on that website as well. There is a phone number. You can actually call and leave a voicemail if you don't want to type anything up. Um, and you can leave a voicemail and then it'll be transcribed and added into our comments. You can um, send us a uh, snail mail, or you can send us an email. Um, we also did have public meetings, as I mentioned, those have now passed, and folks can comment in any language um, that you would like, and we will make sure to translate that and add it to our comment summary. Next slide. So what does the comment look like? I guess the first thing, we've got some, some tips here. Um, the first thing I would just like to share from Sound Transit's perspective is how, you know, this is a draft environmental impact statement. We purposefully put it out there as a draft because we want to hear from folks. Um, we wanna hear um, what matters to you in terms of the alternative and the station location. Do you have preferences in those ways um, of, about those station locations? When you look at the impacts or the potential mitigation, do you feel like we've missed something? Would you like to make sure we have an understanding 
that is a personal perspective or a community member perspective that we may not have been able to capture through our planning tools that we have. We would love to hear from you on those things. And then in particular, um, you know, these are some tips uh, for your comment. So when your comment um, reflects or addresses, um, you know, references information that is in the draft EIS, that is helpful to us. If it's, you know, kind of concise and clear, um, that will also be very helpful for us to be able to follow what you're trying to share with us. Um, and wherever possible, if there's a section in the draft EIS where you're saying, hey, you missed this impact in when it comes to social, you know, or some other uh, neighborhood effect or traffic or, or some location like that, it would be helpful for you to share, you know, a chapter, even a section, a page number. Um, and then any additional explanation or facts or references, just giving more color to that story to help us understand what you mean. Um, so a really simple comment of just sort of, um, um, I'm concerned about this, you know, a uh, you know, I like this alternative, that alternative is great, but if you can give us more color or you have concerns about a particular effect, making sure we really can understand from reading your comment, what effect you're speaking about, what impact you're concerned about, that can be really helpful. Um, and so with that, let me go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to say, I think this is our last slide. We do have this online open house I mentioned earlier. Um, WSB link.participate.online, and there's a ton of information on there. We hope it's really helpful. It is uh, transcreated into multiple languages, um, and it has the draft EIS is available there. Of course, there's lots of paper copies of everything back here as well. The comment now form information about the stations and how the station, um, how we understand the stations might uh, integrate and serve the community from like how you might access the station, where the entrances would be. Um, we have advisory group meetings, as I mentioned, and you can actually watch them from the advisory group tab on this um, uh, website, resources for property owners, um, uh, and then a get involved tab. So that is it, I think, from us. We will, I will hand it off. I, okay. <laughs> All right. Hello again, everybody in virtual. Um, so while we uh, switch some tech here again. I do want to thank uh, thank again Sound Transit for being here. Um, if folks have a question specifically for Sound Transit, um, when we get to the Q and A portion, we'll try to get those uh, out of the chat for those of you in virtual land. Although I'm going to ask where did Lita go. I'm going to ask Lita if she can go over to Jeremy by the camera back there um, and make sure Jeremy can get Lita's. Uh, email address into the chat so folks can send questions uh, for, for follow-up by Sound Transit later if they need to, um, as opposed to those of us in the room who can ask them, as well as, um, you know, hopefully those of you out in virtual land are very comfortable, but um, I do have Starbucks coffee here, um, so we want to thank the Starbucks in Safeway, uh, in the local Safeway branch for uh, donating coffee. Um, tonight into the room. Um, I'm going to keep us moving forward unless is there anything in the chat, Jeremy, that we need to be aware of? All right, I'm going to keep us moving forward then. Um, so the next part, uh, so you heard a little bit from Sound Transit about the EIS process. And so just to, just to be clear, because we're recording in various places, um, so Sound Transit is here supporting us this evening. And what you just saw were some Sound Transit you know, provided slides. Um, we're transitioning now back into the West Seattle Transportation Coalition portion of the meeting. So there may be things that I say or that we have on the slides that are from us and are not necessarily from information from Sound Transit or opinions that are endorsed by Sound Transit. Um, unfortunately, you guys are gonna hear a lot of me tonight. Um, I did not put these slides together. We have uh, traffic engineers um, and, and consultants on our board or that we work with who helped put this together. Um, 
But uh, after helping to put together, um, there were some concerns from their um, employers um, that they may want to actually bid on future sound transit projects and they didn't want to sort of mix that kind of a thing. So uh, they're, they're stepping here that's well above my usual pay grade, um, but we'll go through it together. Um, so as Lita talked about, an environment, an EIS is an environmental impact statement. Um, and when you hear people say DEIS, they're talking about the portion that we're in right now. The draft EIS has come out for public to review, make comments on, and then uh, Sound Transit's folks will go back and uh, look all of that over um, and, and add further responses and further tighten that up before they publish the final document. Um, so the EIS is a document that's prepared to describe the effects for proposed activities on the environment. And EIS also describes impacts of alternatives as well as plans to mitigate those impacts. And so something that's critical for folks to understand is that the EIS is a specific, uh, I believe we have state requirements, but it is a federal process that is used on you know, projects all across the country, transportation, buildings, you know, utility substations, all kinds of things can be subject to having to do an environmental impact statement. And so that's why this is happening separate from the political process that passed the plan or separate from the sound transit boards process that will approve things as the, for the agency to move forward. And so as part of that, there are really specific um, issues that need to be looked at um, and, and, and very prescribed. And so that's what we're gonna talk about to help you shape your comments for this EIS process to make them valuable uh, for sound transit, but also valuable for you to hopefully get your opinions heard and hopefully even a response maybe in the final EIS document. Um, so purpose and need, a written description of why the project is needed. Uh, there are alternatives reviewed. So it looks at alternative actions that are already decided um, on by the, uh, the sponsor or agency, the owner of a project, the voters. Um, in this case, the EIS must describe the likely impacts to the following things. It's particularly looking at the environment, both natural and built, um, how it's gonna affect existing natural spaces, homes and businesses, air, water, noise, traffic, and other health related activities, uh, social justice components, how it might impact indigenous communities, um, economic impacts to livability, as examples, and also impacts to the historical built and natural environments. So for example, how it might impact landmark and cultural resources, um, how it might uh, affect special places such as parks. Um, and we've got uh, sections there uh, referring to that. Um, how does the process work? Well, it's used by the sponsoring entity, in this case, Sound Transit for the light rail extension, to guide the design and implementation of their project and any alternatives. The first product is what we're looking at now, the draft EIS. It helps to identify and define preferred alternatives for the design and execution of the project. Once the draft is issued, the EIS process allows for... I'm missing my word here on the... Side, give me a second. There we go, hybrid world. Um, for giving input on what is in the document back to the sponsors. Input is comments. The sponsor, Sound Transit, uses that input and other information to pick a preferred alternative or perhaps more than one preferred alternative, although I don't think Sound Transit is likely to do that in this case. Um, the final EIS is the second product. An in-depth study of the project with much more detail. So how, is the, how are you, the public, involved in the EIS process? Well, once the DEIS is out, public and private entities can re register their thoughts with Sound Transit for the Light Rail Project, who capture that feedback in their final EIS document. Local, state, and federal agencies also provide feedback under their jurisdictional authority. So when the final document comes out, you'll see letters in there from the city of Seattle, from King County, uh, I would assume King County Metro, um, probably we'll see from the Port of Seattle, which is going to be affected by this. So everybody, everybody up and down sort of at all levels is 
providing their feedback and comments on this. Uh, what feedback can that feedback can be submitted in numerous forms. Um, you can comment on the website. Uh, the address was given earlier. You can send letters to the sponsoring entity. There are community forums. Uh, Sound Transit hosted some official forums earlier this month. Um, this is an example of where they're supporting a neighborhood group doing a community forum. Um, and you may have other opportunities. Uh, and that feedback can hold significant sway with, uh, in this case, the Sound Transit board members who are going to make the final decisions as they pursue defining the preferred alternative and the final features of the project. So let's talk about making comments on the draft EIS. And like I said, making comments that are substantive, that will yield a response and make sure that what you're trying to say gets heard. That's, the, that's why we wanted to hold this workshop tonight. So what is covered in the draft EIS? We had this already. Sorry, it's a repeat. So we'll pause there for anybody uh, watching recordings rather than having to try and scroll back and recording. Uh, so a reminder, you know, particularly environment, natural, natural and built, social justice components, historical built and natural environments. And in those, we're looking at particularly things like natural space, air, water, noise traffic, light impacts to residential and business areas, landmark status, things like that. Um, when the draft EIS is issued, it's time to give impact on the document. Through your feedback, comments, and input, the public can have significant sway as the sponsors pursue defining the preferred alternatives. Things to remember about preferred alternatives, they have built-in inertia. They've already been identified as the most likely solutions, and it takes significant issues with a preferred alternative to be modified or replaced. And so I wanna repeat that again, for those of you who've not been part of an EIS before. The preferred alternative has built-in inertia. They've already been, it's already been identified as the most likely solution, and it will take significant issues identified with those preferred alternatives in order for it to be modified or replaced. Um, what you will also often see in, a, in an EIS is a no build alternative. That's required by the law. That doesn't necessarily mean that the agency is considering not building the project at all, but they are often required to have that as part of the document. So what is a public comment? Well, here's some uh, information and suggestions from the Harvard Law School. They say commenting is an opportunity to influence or change the rule or regulation and make your voice heard. Your comments can make sure that legal requirements, facts, unintended consequences, or even errors are not overlooked. Commenting is your chance to point out issues, offer alternatives and substitute language, and help decision makers identify solutions they may not have initially considered. It can also be an opportunity, we'll probably talk a little later, um, if there's something that was originally considered as an alternative and you think it was a mistake to have it removed, or you think that now that we know more at this point in the process, that maybe one of those previous alternatives or ideas deserves a little more look again, um, this is an opportunity to, to call that to attention. Um, commenting is an important way to share your expertise. You know, for many of you, your business is along the proposed path. Your home is going to be underneath where one of the guideways is proposed to go. And there are things, there's subject matter that you are the expert at because you're right there. No matter how wonderful the staff are, no matter how skilled they are, they are often sitting in offices. They often live in other cities, but actually a lot of the Sound Transit people do live here in the city with us. And if you've been with the West Seattle Transportation Coalition meetings before, you know we often have the local West Seattle living reps of all the different agencies here. Um, but that still doesn't mean that somebody living down in Fauntleroy has an idea what's going on in the West Seattle Junction or in the Avalon neighborhood or in North Delridge. So this is your opportunity to raise issues that they may not be aware of. 
Commenting ensures that your on the ground experience and other important perspectives are taken into account. And again, commenting helps decision makers determine the level of acceptance or resistance in the public to the proposed alternatives. So what's a substantive comment looks like, look like? Well, a substantive comment identifies an issue you have with the document and the language in the document. It says why it's a problem, and it offers other factual and unbiased information for the agency to consider. So I wanna repeat that again. A substantive comment identifies an issue you have with the document or the language in the document. So saying, I really hate this alternative is not going to be a substantive comment for this point in the EIS process. I'm sure Sound Transit will say thank you very much and they will tabulate how many people said they hated that alternative. You want to think about what are the specific reasons that you hate that alternative or what other alternative you think they could pursue in order to build the project. Because remember, the goal of the EIS and the goal of Sound Transit is to build this light rail project. Um, again, so if you hate light rail, we here at WSTC are just fine with you hating light rail and thinking it's a waste of money. But sending that comment to Sound Transit right now is not going to be substantive. It's not going to be useful. And again, the response you will probably get is, thank you very much for your comment. We will document that. So you want to look at making sure your comments are substantive. Qualities of a substantive comment include referencing specific document pages, chapters, or sections, and using objective information. Using facts to question the adequacy, accuracy, methodology, or assumptions of the analysis. Um, a good example here um, but could apply to this project, but often comes up in other projects that we've followed. Um, often people object to uh, transportation, or sorry, traffic modeling. Um, that is in an EIS process, right? Um, you know, staff at agencies are trying to project what traffic's going to look like in 20 years or 25 years or 50 years um, down the road. And you may object to the methodology that they're using. You may think you may have information that you think isn't part of their model. And so that's a really substantive comment. Question something that seems unusual to you. Question if you feel like the problem was presented and the solution was presented, but they didn't show the work to get to the solution. Um, I like to say that it's sort of like, you know, your calculus teacher, if you didn't show the work on the test, they're not gonna give you all the points. Um, sometimes that's a good thing to comment on in the EIS. Um, so uh, I'm gonna keep moving through this dense slide here. Um, propose a reasonable new alternative or revision to the alternative that's presented. Um, I know uh, one of the things we've heard from stakeholders in North Delridge is a suggestion that one of the existing station alternatives could it be moved, I believe, 600 meters. Do I have the right length um, to to one side? So you know, a substantive comment. They don't necessarily. They're not necessarily objecting to the alternative, um, but they're saying based on us living here and what we think makes sense in the neighborhood, we think you could actually just shift this a little bit. Could you look at that and find out if that's possible? Again, specific, direct. If you can name which alternative that is, that's probably even more helpful for them. Um, and uh, identify passages in the document that seem unclear. Um, maybe it's good, but you just didn't understand it. Could they help explain that better in the final document? Um, I'm going to pause if people want to read the slide there or at the end of the recording and you can pause the recording. Uh, uh, tips on the right hand side, but then I'm going to move forward. <laughs> Continuing on what's a substantive comment. Things that do not qualify as a comment as substantive and won't be addressed. Stating that you want your comment recorded as substantive doesn't make it a substantive comment. Crafting an emotionally compelling story. Um, that, that's really good, 
uh, I'll tell you that the Sound Transit board members might want to hear that, but that's so that might be a good example of do you want to make a comment in this EIS process or do you want to lobby Sound Transit board members or other electeds? Uh, again, I would because I'm from the North Delridge neighborhood. Um, I know we've heard comments from a couple of folks who say my family has lived in this neighborhood and owned this house for 75, 80 years, and you're gonna come in and wipe it out and make us move. Um, that may be a really compelling story to the Sound Transit Board Chair, but that's not a comment that is germane to the EIS and not a comment that's, again, Sound Transit will probably respond, thank you very much for your comment, we will document that. Um, don't ask vague or open-ended questions. Don't comment on unrelated projects. Um, I want to emphasize that. So Sound Transit is doing their best, but because of the way our government is structured, and the agencies are structured, which the staff don't have any control over, um, yelling and screaming at Sound Transit about where the buses are going and whether they're the best ideas for where the buses should go is not a helpful comment because Sound Transit does not keep County Metro and Sound Transit runs very few buses. Um, so you might want to, again, call attention to assumptions that are made about where bus routes will go, or if bus ridership is being figured into the ridership at a station, that may be germane. But don't give your idea of where the bus route should go, or how it should be funded, or whether it should be a bigger bus or a small bus. Those are all things that Sound Transit is not responsible for and can't account for in the EIS. Um, so again, um, some examples elsewhere on the slide here. I disagree with closing this specific route, 245A, an alternative E1, because I need the road to access my private land. You're citing the specific section you're commenting on. You're giving a specific example of how you're going to be affected and why that's a problem. An unhelpful comment would be stop closing our roads. They don't know what road you're talking about. They don't know who you are. They don't know what part of the document you're referencing. Um, another example of a substantive comment. It would be helpful if tables 4.2-17 A and B included columns with the background concentration similar to tables 4.2-20 and 4.2-21. That way it is easier to see the project impacts the near field as well as the impact to the community of whatever part of the community. And I'm sure a bunch of you out there in the audience here and in virtual land just fell asleep. Um, but again, we're talking about a very prescribed legal process. And so yes, if you're taking the time to go through and dig into all those tables and maps and things and going, that guideway is too high or too low, or it's crossing my property, or it's not, it's impacting a uh, heron rookery, or whatever it is that you're trying to comment on. The more specific you can be about what section you're referencing, what impacts you're concerned about, and what you think sound transit needs to do are critical. Um, so some more suggestions. Have an open mind, be reasonable. Again, Sound Transit's goal is to build a voter approved project to extend light rail to West Seattle. So keep that in mind, that is their goal and that's how they're going to respond to your comments. So plan your comments as if you're talking to somebody with those goals in mind. You're giving advice, you're trying to be helpful, don't be aggressive. That's not going to get a very good <laughs> response in a federally required legal document. Put the shoe on the other foot. Imagine if you were working at the agency and read your letter or read your letter to the boss and see how it comes up. Have potential solutions and counter issues with reasonable options. Identify what you believe is working or would work better and why you think that. And remember that identical comments can be treated as one comment, including form letters. So if you're an organized neighborhood, uh, like I don't know if we have anyone in the room, but I know there's at least one person in virtual land there uh, from the Avalon neighborhood. It's not good to write some form language and have everybody inundate the EIS comments uh, submissions or everybody inundate the Sound Transit Board with a form letter. 
because that's going to that means they're just going to develop one response, or they're going to capture that and say we heard from you know 24 people who sent in this comment. Make it personal and make it specific to why you are concerned about that and how it's going to impact you and your household or your business. Um, uh, call out here to the West Seattle blog. Um, there was a great comment that was dropped there in an earlier um, article that they published. Um, interested neighbor said, I'm a consultant who specializes in environmental documents, particularly environmental impact statements for large public works projects. I am not involved with this project, but I would like to leave a tip about providing comments. While it is certainly your right to state which alternative or design option you prefer, remember that this is not a vote. Sound Transit will not tally the preferences and pick the one with the most votes. To be most effective, your comment should focus on potentially significant adverse environmental impacts. Don't just say, I don't like alternative X. Add why you think the potential harm to the environment precludes that choice. Focus on topics like social justice and equity, climate change, potential impacts to water of the United States, potential impacts to parks, all these topics have additional federal and state laws behind them that mean that sound transit needs to give them special consideration. Use a neutral tone and remember, it's not a vote. If you only say, I don't like X, without providing factual reasons, the response will be, thank you for your comment. So you've taken the time to go through and find all of those specific references. What's going to happen to your public comment? Well, comments are going to be collected and categorized into groups, businesses, community organizations, individuals, plus substantive and non-substantive. In the final EIS section, comment summary, all public comments are summarized and quantified by topic. Um, again, this is a good example of where we were saying form comments are going to all be, you know, shrunk up into one little thing. The more specific you can get, the more uh, you can ask a specific question to be addressed, the more likely your comment is going to be called out in that final summary. As an example, if you look at other documents uh, for other projects, you'll see, right, the Port of Seattle is probably going to have their entire letter for, printed out in that summary. And it's not just because the Port of Seattle is a government agency and gets to throw their weight around, but it's because they're going to be really detailed and talk about how it's impact, impacting port operations and power lines across the port or how it's going to impact traffic of trucks. And they're going to be really clear if they think Sound Transit missed talking about how they're mitigating their impacts, they're going to specifically call Sound Transit out to say how they're mitigating those impacts. So if you want to be addressed at that kind of level, you've got to be able to cite exactly what those impacts are. And if you think something was missed or not backed up or needs to be studied further. Uh, formal responses to each comment are generic by topic. Comment summary list, comment theme paired with a common response, and these can typically identify impacts and list mitigation as warranted. Copies of all comments and responses to them are contained in an appendix that will be, well, if you saw the draft EIS here in the room copy, so a lot of it already looks like the size of a phone book. So if it, believe me, it will be a lot of stuff, but it will be there somewhere online. It will be documented and it will be part of the official legal documentation. Some ways to maximize your input. Um, vet your idea as feasible or having merit with knowledgeable people and entities. Be prepared to counter issues raised with reasonable options to address them. Um, if all of your neighbors don't have the time to write in, canvas your neighbors. There's no reason you can't write a really substantive comment and then get all of your neighbors to sign their name and address onto it. Um, that's not the same as when I said don't send in form comments. Remember, sending in 24 copies of the same comment is going to be looked at as one comment. 
that is different than saying, we've got this great comment and I'm showing you that a whole lot of us in this particular neighborhood or a whole bunch of businesses in this building or on this block phase are concerned about the same things. You really need to look at this. Um, and then attend every community event where, you, where the topic can be discussed and communicate your idea and issue there as broadly as possible. Um, some folks will frown on me um, and I, we are not endorsing this, as I said earlier in the chat, but a good example of this is there are a number of individuals out there in the community who are arguing for a, uh, an alternative transportation uh, form. Um, if you're really excited about that and you want to support that, that is, uh, that is germane. But again, be willing to communicate that, be willing to communicate why that's an substantive alternative to what's proposed and consider whether arguing for that is something you want to do in the EIS process or something you want to do as a political process to lobby Sound Transit board members. Other ways to maximize your input. I am not going to read through all this slide because we're getting dense and boring. I will pause for a moment. As I said, those uh, in virtual land who want to screenshot or you're watching a recording, you want to pause and read it all. Yep. All right. So I'll end here with a quote from, you know, I was going to do thanks at the end. We'll come back and do more thanks, but I'm going to do the slide right now because it's here and in case people uh, check out in virtual land. Um, Great quote that many people have heard of from Margaret Mead. Never underestimate the power of a small group of committed individuals to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And for a nice history link historical Seattle reference, I will point out that at one point, folks were considering removing the Pike Place Market and only because neighbors got together and lobbied and gave substantive reasons why they thought that was a bad idea and wasn't going to be good in the long run, did they actually stop that project? And there are other examples of that around here. Again, I'm not arguing that we want to stop this project or that West Seattle Transportation Coalition supports stopping this project, but it is possible to do so if a significant number of people are opposed to a project. That is something that comes up in an EIS process. And finally, the West Seattle Transportation Coalition wants to give particular thanks tonight uh, to American Legion Post 63 uh, and Keith Hughes for hosting us uh, to do this hybrid environment. Uh, Delridge Community Co-op, which is in the back um, and is uh, providing some snacks um, and is always looking for folks to sign up um, as members. And again, to Sound Transit staff who are in the room to answer questions um, and uh, you know post things into the chat that you'd like them to respond to. All right. And so we are, how are we time wise? 730, we are running well ahead, yay. Um, so we are at Q&A portion. Um, are there, uh, I'll pitch to Jeremy first. Are there some questions in the uh, chat that we want to uh, ask people? Um, so first is, how do you cite the passes of such such as impacts on stormwater from loss of trees, farm sequestration, air quality, and wildlife? Uh, specifically, this is, if there, if something is missing from the document, how do you cite chapter and verse? Um, so as lead is coming up, so a question in the chat is, how do you cite the absence of something? So they're looking for a specific response to, if you think something is missing in the document, you think they haven't accounted for a particular issue, what's the best way to sort of cite that? All right, I think my thought there is to go ahead and just um, and say that you feel like in the assessment and the environmental impact statement, this is something you care about. You have looked through the document and you don't see it. So you don't think it was assessed sufficiently. So you don't have to necessarily cite chapter, section, 
first. <laughs> if uh, if uh, if you just want to make sure you see an impact and you don't see it in there, categorized. So that is okay. We appreciate those comments. What else do we have in there, Aaron? Should the DEIS cost comparison purchase of land benefits and business tunneling to avoid those losses? Generalize the question, I think that is all of you proposed all purchases seem to be the same thing. Why are they all purchases? Um, so Jeremy summarizing the question is, what if you think all of the alternatives are essentially sort of the same, same or similar or are all causing the same problem and what's the best way to address that? Yes, my answer will be similar again. I mean, I think if you are looking at all the alternatives and you are kind of being specific about your concern and that it is consistent across alternatives, you can go ahead and share that. I think being specific about what that concern is, why the alternatives are of concern to you or, um, or that you are concerned about some missing assessment or impact that is consistent between them, please go ahead and share that in your comments. There was um, a question before that about tunneling versus um, uh, displacement. I don't know if we answered that one, but I could address it if it would be helpful. Okay, so I, I think the question was about, you know, should there be an understanding or a comparison between the impacts and the cost of tunneling versus the impacts and the cost to community of displacement? Um, so first, the cost estimates that are included in the draft environmental impact statement, they do, they include the quantitative cost, not the human community cost, right? They do put a valuation in for purchasing property. Um, related to the alternatives. So you do see kind of an apples to apples comparison with some of the elevated alternatives versus the tunnel alternatives. However, these different factors are not weighted in the draft environmental impact statement. So you can share in your comments that that is a value to you and why you consider one alternative more preferable, maybe for those reasons than another. Um, and that will be helpful for our board. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna make a little adjustment here. Spotlight a bit of the room here. Um, do we have a question in the audience here, or should we go and see if there's more? Yes, we've got a question in the audience. I guess a more general question is: Does it have comments about multiple sections? Did you include one comment that uh, details over the trees or okay, separate comments? Um, so we've got a question that's you know if if you were making multiple comments about multiple different sections, so should you just sort of submit one long comment referencing those, or should you sort of su submit them as separate comments? I think, yeah, I'll stay right down here so I don't have to do the thing. Um, I would say in, in whatever way is, is easiest for you. I think sharing your comment, you, if you have looked at the alternatives and you've noticed a handful of impacts, you can go ahead and list all of them out in one letter if you'd like, or one email, or one voicemail to us. But if you, you list out those effects and then you think of others later as you're continuing to look and you're continuing to work, you can add another comment. We'll take all of those. Uh, Marty, are we expected to read all four forms? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, humans take them to suss out the few elements that you need to come. So, uh, Marty Westerman, our vice chair, his question is Are we expected to read all four volume, voluminous phone book volumes in order to suss out the specific comments, or are there, are there some, uh, you know, are there some key sections? That folks might want to look at, or is there a shortcut to finding what you're looking for in the document? Yes. Oh, that's a very good question, Martin. Um, so I would say, um, certainly, we understand it is a lot of information. It's a little bit like a choose your own adventure, perhaps, in terms of how deep you'd like to go. What we hope is that your gateway is the website, so you can go into the website 
we do have those kind of high level snapshot categories of how the alternatives might on a you know a high level be differentiated from each other and those differences. You can then if you'd like say, well, I'd like to learn more about parks. We do have in the website a table of contents um, and some um, kind of uh, questions like you know common questions and here's where you would find it. So that's a way to kind of navigate your way maybe to what you'd be most interested in. We have here as a resource to a reader's guide to the draft EIS, which is a document that I think we have it here, but and it's online as well, but helps you kind of know where you would find what in the document. And then of course we do have an executive summary as well. It is still many pages, but it is <laughs> it is less pages. And so maybe that's another resource that can be super helpful. And I'm sure our experts here probably have some thoughts too <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, I would add, you know, as we pointed out in the slides, you know, there, there are some specific issues that they're legally required to respond to. And so it should come as no surprise that those tend to get section headers. So it is a little helpful if you haven't really sort of looked beyond the executive summary yet. If you're concerned about traffic impacts in your neighborhood, if you're concerned about impacts to historical buildings in your neighborhood. Um, uh, like I said, if you're concerned about impacts to parks or you know bird habitat, there will be high level sections. Um, you know, I'm going to pass it off to Deb so you can hear someone else. Uh, Deb Parker, another board member, who has got a helpful cheat sheet with some of the sections. And there's some water down there if you want. <laughs> or if you need any more coffee, let me know. So uh, we put together uh, uh, a big old cheat sheet just to say <laughs> what's where. And if you need that, it's the yellow page at the back table. And we can also uh, get this on our website too, so you can have it at home. It's just easier than, I found it easier than trying to find things uh, uh, by flipping through the phone books. <laughs> Although many people don't remember what phone books are. So it's always important to go through the big document too. It's, it's enlightening, thanks. So you have just a second, Joe's up next, um, but this will be a good point for me to pitch. So we can help you a little bit if you want to email us, info at westseattletc.org. That's westseattletc.org. But a good time for me to pitch, to remind everyone, we're a volunteer group. We're all volunteer. We don't charge membership fees or anything yet. Um, so we are doing all of this on our own. Most of us either have 40 hour a week day jobs or are retired. Um, so like if you want to send us some things, that's okay, but don't expect that you're necessarily going to hear back from us immediately. Um, but we can help you poke through a little bit if you've got a specific issue you're looking for. Um, Joe. Uh, curiosity. Uh, what happens to me could happen to neighbors of the city. Um, I'm not sure how to go about it because following an MOU, sometimes a life bill is a follow by a member of understanding. And so I've been coming from a different place because they've already finished my area of the city of Florida. That's what they said. So uh, if I'm hearing correctly, um, Joe Joe's saying that uh, he's a property owner in Taquilla. Um, and he's already experienced going through some of this with Sound Transit. And uh, what do you do if their MOU, their Memorandum of Understanding, um, says they're going to meet certain mitigation? Is that sort of what you're talking about? Certain certain ways they're going to respond or, or address you as a property owner, and then they don't follow through. Um, and how should people here feel about that? So I think the concern is about when we uh, are taking property for the project when we have to construct. Did I get that right? Wrong. Wrong. Okay. I'm so no, sorry. I missed it. The development of or stage phase one, I should say. Uh, you're shaking my house. So I have a lawyer. I saw that you convinced my lawyer to drop me, kind of like that Kevlar case where we all got sent to New York City to New Jersey for two weeks. So my lawyer has a right to drop me because he gave us the payment, even though it was a certified letter, and that should have kept me in the lawyer column. So 
many other things. Um, well, I, I, I just have to. Um, you know, because of all this, I'm constantly being followed by marijuana supporters, some transatlantic -like supporters. Uh, you know what? They'll go upwind from me as I be downwind. We had a bus stop at the Soto Station, Lander Bridge just finished. You know, I got nothing to do, but I'll be in continuously attacked by a airborne illness that can give contact time. And I don't know what to do about it because they call it the police, it's legalized. It ain't my problem. I mean, what happens to the class? Second of all, how do you stop something like slips and sequels, which I was cut off by, I think it was uh, Mr. Marcioni of uh, Redmond, mayor, and uh, I'm trying to talk about something, and I always put in public comments in the official room, same as always. So I've had numerous contact with Sound Trends and I felt so one day they just decided to huh. cut. So I actually think that there's a slip under my property caused by Sound Trends and Light Road. What are you going to do about the neighbors who need to take pictures of their fence posts, their homes? You'll have, I have tracks in my home. There's no way I can upset, maintain, and keep up with it. Another thing is, all right, we're going to stick with that sound. Right? The other thing is, can, can, I, can, I, pause, can I pause you there, Joe? And it sounds, it sounds like you might want to talk to them directly in the back of the room. Um, but so I, I, I think what Joe is raising, raising Lita is, uh, you know, pro we've got a lot of property owners who are really concerned that their property is going to be taken. Um, we're hearing, we have heard from other people besides Joe. Who, who feel like they weren't treated well previously. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what is Sound Transit currently doing reaching out? I know you've been in Del Ridge and you've been out long. What are you doing right now to reach out to property owners? How do you kind of work with them to address some of the key issues during construction that might impact them? Or if you need to take their property, what are, you know, it's a short, but what are some of the things that Sound Transit do? Michael, may I have one more thing? Since we're on property property. Well, like I said, let's I'll let them answer that. And, and I think it'll, it'll no. for this for yeah. our answer also. So, Sound Trends of Light Rail says they are not to get involved on corners of lots. So, me and my neighbor, we had a disagreement years back. But because my neighbor decided to text or computerize uh, Sound Trends of Light Rail, I got a letter. My surveyor said I was right. But because sometimes the land rail got involved, they said, nope, this guy's right. But it stands in the contract. I think you, you, are not you bring to up involved. a lot of concerns that I, I hope maybe I can start to address, and I really would like to, to talk with you more. So I, I think, as Michael was saying, and, and as you were saying, Joe, um, you know, it is certainly a challenge as we're trying to provide new transit service and build this infrastructure in cities where um, people, communities have homes, you have um, businesses, you have uh, beloved grocery stores and and, uh, and and services that you have in your community. Um, I can I cannot speak for past experience. I've, I've joined Sound Transit um, with this project with Seattle and Ballard. Uh, one thing that we've been trying to implement um, is really early engagement. So we started a really extensive engagement process a lot earlier on this project um, than we have on other projects in the past. And our hope is that we can reach folks and meet with folks much earlier on um, to try to both make sure that you're able to engage in the process now um, and affect um, uh, the decisions and, uh, and um, inform us on the impacts and the potential mitigation and inform our board. Um, we are also meeting with folks individually to understand your particular circumstance, um, concerns that you might have with the light rail, so we're comparing your issues with the plans that are in the draft AIS. It's very informative conversation both ways. And then we continue to be engaged throughout uh, planning and design and then into construction. Um, but I, I know that this is certainly a challenge. Oh, right. Thank you, Michael. Joe, Joe, I'm gonna, like I said, go talk to them on the side because since we have folks virtually, 
we've got some different recordings going on. I want to make sure that like they can't hear in a lot of cases the details that you're bringing up. So I want to keep us moving. Um, uh, Jeremy, um, do we have a, well, well, don't worry, I see you. Um, do we have uh, some more questions from virtual land? As politics come, are those wins and those losses the Visible to the rest of the public. So, can you see someone else's comment to help shape a comment? That's a good question. Um, as the public makes comments, is there a way to see the comments of other folks that are making um, to help shape yours? And so, the simple answer is no, that's not how this process generally works. Um, because people are making, again, this is a federally prescribed and sometimes state prescribed, depending on where in the country you are. Um, but it is here. Um, there are specific legal requirements. And so these documents are being submitted and there's a whole process to go through and vet them and respond. Um, that said, that's one of the reasons we're having a workshop like this is we're inviting folks to chat with each other in the room and see if you've got some shared things in common or could help each other. Um, and again, folks who are still here uh, in virtual land, I'll activate uh, some breakout rooms shortly when we're done with the Q&A. And so if you want to log off then, or if you want to go into a breakout room and chat a little bit with some of the other people and see if you've got some things in common, um, this, this is a good opportunity to do that. Yeah, I help. Um, we go to Sound Transit Light Rail Board of Directors meeting, hit the blue live stream, and you can see public comments in the official room for many months. Um, we've got a good comment from uh, from the audience here, reminding folks that you know keeping track of the Sound Transit Board meetings, which are virtually streamed, and so seeing the comments and things that people post there is also a good way you might see some of the things that uh, people are raising. Uh, I want to thank Sound Transit. I'm only interested in kind of comments. So really my question that follows this process many, many years is the timing that is involved in data collection. I'd like to know when that data collection was finalized and her route was determined, as well as the subsequent two other routes, so that I don't have to this whole process, and I feel like I'm also capturing some of the more relevant things that are occurring in this community at this point in time. And it's not just for me, I think it's for all of the West Seattle community so that we can actually be in a position to answer not what was in the past, but also what is currently now, because we have the bridge and that will come back at some point in time, but we also need to be rethinking our alignments that have to do with the ferry terminal that's being addressed, our bridge that's being addressed, the realignment of that poor community that's had to deal with this entire island park. Oh my God, what they've been through. So let's 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 get a little more historical perspective about what was there. When you make these decisions, and it's now on the slides, and where we're headed now, because I'm not real sure of the next decisions. Okay, I'm going to try to summarize a really long question <laughs> uh, here in the room. Um, but, you know, that I imagine a lot of us share essentially. You know, I've been following this for many years now, and I've been involved all along. And uh, her specific question it, to the Sound Transit reps is about, you know, how do you find out uh, when this data was gathered, when certain alternatives were chosen and the data was gathered for those alternatives? Uh, and when was it concluded? So that she can talk about, did we take into account things we've learned, like for example, with the West Seattle Bridge closed right now, which we know will come back, but we're learning different things about how people travel around the neighborhood and how they may uh, forever now change how they travel around the neighborhood. So how can we comment or respond to that? And before I hand it over to Lita, I'll share that. Um, oh, in a substantive way, which is the purpose of our workshop. Thank you. Um, 
we this is only useful for our, our for the specificities we commented on, but we have copies of the previous letters that that the transportation coalition sent uh, to Sound Transit out on the tables in the back, and so that calls uh, calls out some of the alternatives that were looked at in previous years and passed on. And then um, if you find me later, uh, we have a number of historical documents from Sound Transit that we would be happy to have you look over or look through if you want to get a sense of when something was perhaps put out with them and then suddenly was no longer. I believe this question is about me. Yeah. I, this question is more on a generalized basis for that may not really feel comfortable about is their comment going to be taken seriously unless it's substantive and therefore tiny. Right. So I'll hand it over more generalized question really for everyone. How, if people want to make a substantive comment and be taken seriously, how do they understand when these different alternatives have been chosen or why an alternative that they thought was on the table beforehand is no longer how do they get a sense of when the, the timing to make these decisions when things come on and come off when the data is correct so i'm going to start and i'm going to hand it over to jason so first there is an appendix one of the appendix <laughs> appendices appendix m actually talks about the alternative development process what was looked at um, what happened from you know one screening to the next? So that may be a helpful resource just to get a picture of the process from before. Then I want to hand it over to Jason to just talk about. We started to um, work on the draft environmental impact statement in 2019, late 2019. So maybe you could talk about kind of when did that work sort of wrap up as we started to really write our findings and what's in front of us today and how it relates to the bridge. If you can tell us. Yes, yeah, so as Lena mentioned, we went to the alternative development phase and the board directed us to study alternatives in the draft EIS through two board motions in May and October of 2019. So after the May board motion, we got to work on the draft EIS. After October, the other alternatives that were added to the draft EIS, we started doing the work on those. Um, I can give one example of uh, transportation, transportation analysis, the modeling that we did for the draft EIS was for the pre-closure of the bridge. So we looked at the uh, the transportation impacts with the system before the bridge closed. Um, so you talked about you know the detours and things that are happening now. Um, it wasn't based on that analysis. It was the precondition. Um, a lot of the work, the, the heavy part of the work, was done before the bridge closed. So late 2019, early 2020. We continue to work on this and to refine what's in the draft EIS all the way up until we published, um, just to continue to do work and make sure that we got it as right as we could, but as Lita mentioned, it's a draft and we're looking for feedback on that analysis and things that we may have missed, you know, for people who live in the community um, and we may not have seen. So we'll uh, we'll keep working on that. Um, but it was really a, a long process, but the substantive part was done early on. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's take Keith, and then we'll go over here. So my, my question about the environmental impact is what, what's it? Does the environment, environmental impact statement of this project include the environmental impact of the construction of the project or just this is what it's going to cause to your neighborhood and your life when it's done. Does the environmental impact statement in this draft form or its final form have a section somewhere that says, this is the millions of tons of carbon that's going to be spewed into the environment from all of the diesel trucks that are going to be moving material out of the West Seattle area over a non-existent bridge right now? And you know, I've been in the construction industry a lot of years, which has made absolutely no improvement in construction equipment in 75 years. It's all filthy, dirty, diesel spewing, god awful equipment. 
is the environmental slash air quality impact of the construction phase of this project part of that environmental impact statement? Do you want to summarize that or do you want me to? <laughs> you want to summarize the question and then I'll sure summarize. and keep this uh and I was asking it does the environmental the draft environmental impact statement deal with the the quantification of the impacts on the environment from the construction aspects is, was really his focus. Uh, point case in point was quantifying the number of trips by really nasty uh, <laughs> vehicles that haven't changed their technology in a long time. Okay. So did I summarize that pretty well? Yeah. Thanks. Can I take another question? Please? Let me let's finish this. Yes, same question. What about what about five to seven years of traffic congestion and stuff? In comma, semicolon, and oh, okay. traffic quantifications during the construction periods with these really yeah, not the construction period. Got it. construction period. Uh, thanks. Yeah. So, without getting into the details on what's in the analysis, I will note that we do the draft EIS and we look at it for two purposes. We look at the final build condition, what are the impacts of the project, but we also look at all of the categories that were on that slide that I went over the built environment, the natural environment, the transportation environment for the period of construction as well. So we could uh, we could look into the draft EIS and we could look into the exact impacts for each category. Oh yeah. All right. Sorry. So we, we couldn't have everyone here physically just given a couple of meetings and I thought our environmental lead is a China listen in and she texted me to let me know <laughs> that we are continuing to work on requirements for contractors to use better fuels. Um, I, although we are probably not the people to be able to get into the deep details on that, so we can follow up on that. And then section 4.2.6 on air quality. Um, there's an FTA model that includes embodied carbon for construction and direct emission. So hopefully that is helpful to you. Want to repeat that? 4 yeah, 4.2.6 on air quality. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, that. <clears throat> At least for some of you folks in virtual land, um, it, if it helps, um, just an idea of some. I, we've uploaded some photos um, in the, on the Facebook page. Um, if you want to see just just a, a small portion of some of the pieces of the document, um, but you can see that there's a there's um, conceptual drawings and the appendix there that those are in. Um, you can see a whole bunch of them stacked in a circle around on the table of so the different appendices that apply to transportation and environmental and things like that, um, as well as there's a specific racial equity toolkit um, that was done on the project. And so just some of the examples um, uh, to help you think about specific appendices that you can pull up. On that. And I see Jeremy is, thank you, Jeremy, is moving that camera around to give you a sense on the tables in the back there. Another question. Um, yes, we have another question in the room. Mine was kind of geared towards the woman I was speaking before because uh, I also have been going to the meeting since the beginning, and uh, I was very frustrated that the well, one of the most popular uh, routes was kind of tabled by, you know, not the people that were voting, and it was uh, the tunnel route, which was the least amount of construction in position on homes and construction and, and uh, cutting off the and all that stuff for however many years, like you were saying, you know, it's just that small section and then Genesee was going to be like impacted, but other than that, there wasn't much impact. and. Yeah, it's like we're going to have the road in front of our house be completely demolished for how many years. And, you know, it's a main road. You're, and you're talking about those, the, the, tunnel, the long tunnel alternative. The tunnel that went from, uh, you know, right across the, the, the terminal line, poked in, and then came out right Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of a totally different line. Yeah. Uh, um, both Youngstown and then, you know, they talked about having a, the station there and cover the skate park and then have it go again and then 
Punch in the tunnel again. Or so was your question the like, way. how would you reference that, or? Uh, it was just like, all of a sudden we weren't allowed to talk about it, and um, it was really, really frustrating. It was when we were meeting at the Youngstown School, and it, they were just like, no, uh, you're not. We're that's no longer an alternate, and everyone kept saying, well, wait, that was one of the most popular alternates because only at the two or four houses were going to be impacted. And none of the businesses there and the street wasn't going to get, and we were going to have this big, huge thing in front of everybody over everybody's roofs and behind their backyards and stuff. It was just a very low impact. And, and it was very frustrating to just be like, kind of like, oh, you, this is what the tunnel you're thinking of. It was very. Okay. Why is that from your consciousness? And, um, and I asked about several other times again. Right after that, and they still just were like, well. so, so I'll let you get into the details with them in the back later. Um, so to, to try and summarize the question in the room, um, uh, another attendee saying, you know, I too have been following this for years and all the different alternatives and things, and sort of saying, you know, there was there was a particular alternative that was considered early on. Um, she referenced uh, the purple line uh, alternative for folks who remember that. Um, that was very popular in some of the community meetings that she attended, and then suddenly it was sort of off the table, um, and uh, she didn't she didn't understand why or how that decision was made. And so I think again a question of like, you know, how, how do we learn or understand when alternatives were taken off the table and why, and, and how does one reference an alternative that maybe is no longer there? And says, you know, I'd really like you to, to look at this again, or you need to say in the document why that early alternative was taken off. I think Michael, you basically said it. So an earlier reference that Appendix M that talks about the alternatives development and screening process. And the idea of that process was to look at a broad range of alternatives and try to screen down to have a, a more narrow range of alternatives in the draft EIS. But what you can do is a reference that appendix M and that particular alternative and reference it in your comment and why you think that would be a good alternative and particularly the impacts that you're concerned about with the existing alternatives that are in the draft EIS. That would be a, a, a great comment. Yeah, it's like years and years now of Going to be like up in the air, and it's just you know, all right? So, so I'll repeat uh, Lena referenced Appendix M, which covers how some of the alternatives, uh, deliberation and, and process went, um, and captures some of that history. Um, and so, you know, like we said, you, you can't cite those things, so that's a good place. You want to look for that, uh, that appendix and you want to go in and, and uh, not being super familiar with that. But so, if you know, if the reason it's removed is something like we thought it was too expensive or we thought it would, you know, this alternative would impact too many houses and businesses and something we've learned since then, or that's in the draft EIS is maybe we realize now that some of the other alternatives are more expensive or similarly impact numbers. Uh, a substantive comment would be, you know, this earlier alternative that's cited here in Appendix M, you know, we, we think it was ruled out at the time for these reasons, but what we now know subsequently, we think is why you need to reconsider it. We think they're more equivalent now, and that's no longer a reason to remove that as an alternative. So that might be one way you, you work that back in to sort of show why the reason an alternative was removed is either no longer valid or things have changed as we've learned more information in the process. Um, let's see, Jeremy, do we have anything else uh, here in the chat um, that we should call out or should we look at breaking out in the tables or break out in the um, So that question I see is, is one about can the public be public comments live? Um, all right. Um, so again, I think did we get Lita's email in the chat? Um, so again, uh, folks, if you scroll up in the chat, you do have Lita's email, um, and you can send questions there. 
Um, you can go to wsblink.participate.online, which is the open house, and you can find out there how to uh, find documents and how to submit public comments. Um, and there, I assume there's an email address there as well, where people can say, hey, I need to find this out. Um, we, we are going to break here in the room and go to, uh, to tables in the back. Again, as I promised, um, if you are interested in hanging around in virtual land um, and chatting with some people there, I mean, you've probably been doing that in the chat here, um, but I am gonna create a couple of breakout rooms here. Um, I think I'll make three um, and give you the option to choose the room. Um, and so those rooms are open. Um, and you should be able to just head on into them. And uh, it, it looks like maybe lots of folks have dropped out. Um, but, uh, you know, if the, what is it, four or five of you who are still there want to uh, go into a room and chat with each other, um, feel free. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Can you also make a comment that we have a special? Hey, can you turn it off? Did they cut it off? No, it's important to comment. Um, I gotta go look at the shoes. In the room.